Well, good morning once again, everybody. We're watching online. Hello, my name is Eric Bucci, and, and if it's your first time here at Cornerstone Church, we want to welcome you. Thank you for being uh, our guest. Thank, and if you have not been in the church, I've seen, I haven't seen some of you in over a year, and it's so good to see your faces, at least most of them. And uh, can you give a big, come on, nice and loud for everyone at home as well. <laughs> It's very confusing, all that's been going on, but, uh, you know, I hope you, uh, we just want to encourage you uh, and um, what's been happening with this whole COVID thing, and I know it's been confusing, and I just appreciate everyone's patience with this. Not even the CDC knows what's going on. <laughs> it's, it's been very confusing. It's been very difficult, but we really need to extend grace to each other and to love each other. And so um, I'm not going to get into all the schematics right now. I can go to our website to find out what our policy is at this point. But it's just so good to see everyone, and it's good to be back into some sort of, uh, I can actually see you smile. And, and you guys have beautiful smiles uh, you really do. You got beautiful eyes, too. You know, as I, I really got to appreciate your eyes. Uh, you can't hide those worshiping eyes. And uh, so it's been great with that. Well, we are in a series uh, about the whole, actually, we were in a series of First Peter, but today is Pentecost Sunday. And, uh, and what is Pentecost Sunday? I just want to say to you, happy birthday to the church. Because Pentecost was the day the church was inaugurated into its ministry, and it happened in Jerusalem in a place called the Upper Room, and over 2,000 people gave their lives to Christ in that first day. A very, very interesting day and a very important day, and, and, and very interesting when you think about what the church was going through, that church was kind of in quarantine. They were, they were shut up in a room. They were scared. They didn't know what was going to happen. The Romans and the Jewish people that were not believers looked at this sect of Judaism. By the way, that's what it was. Je by the way, Jesus is Jewish. And when you see the anti-Semitic things going on in New York City, in city, it's disgusting. And so Jesus is Jewish. We're grafted in. Just want to let you know that. So they are quarantined. They're, they're hid away. They don't know what to do. And, and Jesus says, wait, we'll talk about it in a few moments. And so what is Pentecost all about? It is the birth of of the church as we know it today, and something extraordinary happened. But I'm going to ask you a quick question. When we talk about Pentecost, what is Pentecost? And when I say the word, go ahead, when I say the word Pentecostal, let's be honest here. Come on, we're, this is our living room. We call it our living room. When I say the word Pentecostal, what comes to your mind? Just be honest. If someone says, oh, he's a Pentecostal. What do you say? The whole word of God. Okay, that's great. Anyone else? You can speak out. 50 days. Oh, you stop it. You ruin my, you steer my thunder. <laughs> okay. How about this? You might be afraid to say this. That's the church across town. It's a little bit different than ours. They, they have boxes of snakes and you know, just, they act kind of weird and I don't like that. Maybe some of you think that, unfortunately, the word Pentecost has gotten a, a bad rep and a bad, uh, bad reputation in some regards. But another way, what is Pentecostal? It's not some sort, Pentecost is not some mysterious, thank you, Chris, not some mysterious word, but what actually that means is this. It means 50. Ever hear pentagram? Not that we have those here. Pente, five point star, right? Pent, and then to the 10th power. That's all it is. It means 50. So someone says, I'm a Pentecostal. It means I'm 50. And I, by the way, I am over 50. But anyhow, beside the point. So Pentecostal just means 50. Okay, that's, it, that's all it really, actually the word means. But it, it, it was something where the God, the Holy Spirit, came upon the church in an unusual and powerful way, inaugurated a new age in the church. Something that was prophesied for millennials. And so that's what it basically, first of all, it means that. But also, I want to bring your attention to what the festival was. I, I didn't know this until this past week. I learned something new this past week. I like when I learned new things as I was studying. For, by the way, I have so much material. It's disgusting. I wish I could share it with you, and I just feel like the Lord put on my heart to start a series on the Holy Spirit. We're going to do it once we're done with First Peter, maybe in the fall. Come on. And, and we're going to do it a little differently this time. In the past, we did a series on the whole the gifts of the Spirit, another series on the fruit of the Spirit, and I think the Lord said, enough of that. 
put them together or it's not right. You need the fruit and you need the gifts together. That's how you walk. Otherwise, you're hopping around, hopping mad without it. You need both. You can't have one without the other. They are interconnected. It's like taking the right brain from the left brain. You can't do it. And sometimes at church, we dissect and we parse so much to make ourselves different. No, you need the fruit and you need the gifts simultaneously. And so we're going to get into that. We're going to break it down. This is just kind of like, this is for Pentecost today. There's so much to share. And listen, we're entering an age and a day. We're going to need more of the power of the Holy Spirit than we ever have before. The person and the work. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is not an it. How would you like if someone called, hey, it? Now, I'm going to date myself. Maybe some of you watch TV Land. How many of you ever watched The Addams Family? They, they had a, this relative called Cousin or what? It. Cousin It, thank you. And Cousin It had no face. Just had long hair. And they called it It. In so many ways, the church has been that way. We're cool with the Father. We like the Father. We like the Son, too. We invite him over, but it, that's during the family, you know, with the family meals, we kind of put it on the other side of the table. We don't necessarily want to deal with it. Those are for those other people. And many times we've done that. We've quarantined the Holy Spirit because we don't understand it. And we've seen people, we think the Holy Spirit means weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird. I'm weird. See, I'm going to call myself. The Holy Spirit is not weird. Okay, just because someone acts weird does not mean the Holy Spirit is weird. I've been in churches, and I like it. I, I, went to, I, I go into churches sometime, and people are, are literally running around the church in a Jericho march when the pastor's preaching. I enjoyed myself, but I was like, okay, it's a little different. I've been to other churches where people are dancing. I had one pastor friend of mine. I just want to, can I just be real with you for a few moments? I had a pastor friend of mine that <laughs> he worked as staff at a, at a Pentecostal church. It was a good church. And he, he kept asking his neighbor to come to church, like, for a year. Finally, his neighbor came. I know you've done the same thing. You ever do that? You invite someone to church, and the pastor speaks about something. Oh, why do they have to speak about that today? <laughs> so, anyhow, he brings his friend. There was no room. He had to go in the front row. His friend. That's just a true story. Uh, his name is Ed. I'm not going to tell you his last name. So, this person comes up with a flag. Is dancing like there's a flag. He's having a good old time. There's nothing wrong with dancing, having a good old time, but you got to think about other people, right? And so the person's going, whoosh, whoosh, and it's slapping it. I'm not making this up. The flag hit the guest in the forehead, and it, it drew blood. Yeah. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's stupid. I'm just going to make I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. And, and, and so many things, people blame the Holy Spirit. Well, it's just the Spirit. I can't help myself. No, you can't. Okay, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is gentle. The Holy Spirit is strong. The Holy Spirit is amazing. And we're going to talk about who the Holy Spirit is. And what, it's not in it. It's a person. It's part of the Godhead. All right? So this is what happened in Leviticus. Moses is talking to the Jewish people. They have these wonderful festivals to help them remember and to celebrate, lest we forget. And he says this, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. Now, what's the Sabbath, everybody? What day of the week is that? Saturday. What's the day after the Sabbath? Why well, isn't that a coincidence? A day after the Sabbath, you are to celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost Sunday. So God was setting it up way, 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 hundreds of years before. Think about that for a minute. Amazing. You'll see that all through the scriptures. So you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So what they would do 50 days after the Passover, the Passover was the celebration when the death angel crossed over the lentils of the, um, over the um, Jewish community and they put the blood on the top and the side that was called the Passover, the blood of the lamb. That's when they basically got saved, if you will, as a culture. And then what happened was the spirit of death passed over and if you had the blood on you, you were saved. So what this was, was a celebration of the first fruits. So it was a great time. Jerusalem was full of people. People worshiped God. People came together and all that. It was a day after the Sabbath. From that day, you shall have brought the sheaf of the way. So it was seven weeks, okay? And you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new, an interesting, new grain to the Lord. So that's what Pentecost was. It was a Jewish festival. 
50 days after the Passover. Jesus, when he rose again from the dead, he was, he was hanging out, showing himself for 40 days, showed himself to over 500 people, and then he ascended into heaven and said, I'll be back, basically, and he says, I want you to wait, and so they waited. They didn't know this. They waited for 10 days, 50 days, okay? And then the day of Pentecost fully came. So what is Pentecost? What happened at Pentecost? Well, and while, and while staying with them, he ordered them. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Do not depart from Jerusalem. I don't want you leaving Jerusalem, but wait. Now, how many people like to wait? I hate waiting. I do. That's why I like microwaves. Okay, but wait for the promise. What is a promise? Something that will be fulfilled, right? Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So he's asking his disciples to wait. And it was so interesting. Uh, I used to think that, used to, another thing I found out this past week, I used to think they hung out in the upper room and never left and just camped out. That's not true. If you read, if you look at the, the grammar of it, they actually went to the upper room and they went to the temple. And they went to the upper room. I, I think it's important to be in our homes, but it's also important to get back in the habit of being in a community of believers in a larger gathering like Sunday morning. And it's so good to see everyone. That's what they were doing. They were waiting, but every day they were going, 120 of them, to the upper room. So wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized. Baptized means completely submerged with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. I want you to wait, Jesus says. So when they come together, they asked him, like, like we do as well, Lord, what about the mask mandates? What about, oh, I'm sorry. Lord, <laughs> Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to come back now, God? Are you going to come back? Is this the second coming? Are you going to restore your kingdom? God, tell us what's going to happen. We want to know all the details. Uh, we don't want to read Tim LaHaye's book series anymore about uh, that. We want to know from you, Jesus, what's going to happen. We want to know the secret. We want to be on the in information. And Jesus says, sure, I'll tell you all the prophetic things you didn't know so you can be smarter than your neighbor. That's what it says in the next verse, right? Nope. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. It's okay to, to wonder about it, but it's not for you to know. For the Father has fixed in his own authority. But what are we to do, everybody? Are we to worry about second coming? Yeah, we should be ready. But we should not be fixated if on, the, on, the, on all these things, spending all of our time. But you will receive power. And the Greek word power is dunamis, the same where we get the English word dynamite. You will receive Kind of like the old program, dynamite. Okay, I'm really dating myself this morning. I'm having a good time. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. The word witnesses does not mean you just say hello. Witness means you do the same thing that Jesus did. My witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. So he says, I want you to wait for the power. Don't leave home without the Holy Spirit. Now, what happened? They waited. And when the day of Pentecost fully arrived, they were all together in one place. It says they were in one accord. Not the, not the Honda, but they were in one accord. Thank you. I really appreciate all your help today. It's nice to see smiles instead of smiling eyes. So they were all in one accord in one place, and what happened? And the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, that's what often happens. You obey God, you do the right thing, and suddenly God shows up, even though it's been happening a long time. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. I have a friend of mine where this happened to in, his, in his village in Kenya, Africa. I'll share it when that series comes. And divided tongues as of fire. They didn't have, like, fire come out of their mouth. It was a simile, fire. They had tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on what? Each one. The women, the men, everybody. In fact, Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw the birth of Jesus, and she also seen the birth of the church. Pretty neat. 
So it rested on each one of them, and they were what? All, just the spiritual ones. No, all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other, oh, here we go, tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. I knew it. Listen, hang on, everybody. I'm going to ask you a favor. Please just let go of your preconceived notions and just read Scripture. Okay? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. It was a big, big festival. All different nations, different language groups, different cultures, different skin colors, okay? And, and uh, this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. Like, what is going on here? They even said, you guys are drunk. I said, no, we're not drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. And Peter gave a message, and 3,000 or 2,000 gave their life to Christ, okay, together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. Now, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. So I want to say happy birthday, church. Okay? Pentecost is the birthday of the church. That's, that's true. And also, the unity of the church and ethnicities. This is amazing that you have all different people groups, different language groups. That's why what's happening right now in India matters to us. What's happening in North Korea matters to us because we're one body, different ethnicities, unity, all different types of people were together. Okay? Now, the whole, now the, to give you an idea what happened. There was mass confusion, yet they heard the glory of God. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, something took place in Genesis chapter 11. And the story of when people began to be separated. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have one language. And this is the only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Why? Because they're in unity. What would happen when the church is together in unity? Nothing would be impossible. What does the enemy want to do? Divide the church. What does God want to do? Unify the church. And so you can even see for unbelievers, right? Nothing would be impossible for you. Come, let us go down and let's go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And then we had different language groups, people got separated. But what happened on the day of Pentecost? God said, Let us go down. What happened? Let us go down. And brought what? brought unity to the Bible. It actually undid what happened in the church. What happened back here, it actually was a, a picture, and God brought unity to the church. All different ethnicities were touched by the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Actually, we're late to the party. Okay? And Zephaniah 3.9 says this. Uh, I'm sure you guys read Zephaniah this morning before you came to church. My favorite book of the Bible. <laughs> For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with what? One accord. It's always been God's desire for one accord. Now, back in April 9th, 1906, this is amazing to me. God didn't choose somebody that was the upper echelon society. He chose a one-eyed black preacher named William Seymour, who spoke at the Azusa Street Mission. A bunch of poor people that didn't have much clout and much influence, but when the Holy Spirit came, this wonderful, godly man helped birth a movement that we are a part of today. What basically happened was the Holy Spirit in large segments of the body of Christ was neglected. The, spirit, the spiritual gifts, all that was neglected. God reintroduced something that he always had, always going on to the church. Think about this, everybody. A one-eyed black preacher helped spur a revival. People from around the world came here, and there was unity. All different ethnicities were together. And don't forget, this wasn't that much, uh, I mean, slavery wasn't that far behind in 1906. And there was unity. And even the Assemblies of God, which we're a part of, they, they sworn, and they, was all, they had all African Americans, different ethnicities, and all of a sudden, you know what happened? We got into ourselves, and they began to separate and segregate. 
Well, next thing you know, you had the African, you had African American the same as God. You had the same as God over here, and they separated, and they began to get like the world. We can never let the world shape the church. We should let God shape us. And what racism and elitism came back in the church, but it didn't happen on the day of Pentecost, and it didn't happen when God visited very strong in Azusa Street. And so what, is, what happened later on to the credit of the Assemblies of God? They asked for forgiveness. They repented. They had a, a reconciliation service, and they both washed each other's feet. They said, we were wrong, and there's a reconciliation of that again, and God is bringing unity to the body of Christ. Listen, it's always been God's design for all of us to work together, a beautiful mosaic, and you cannot see Jesus' face without a mosaic of different ethnicities and people groups because we're all God's people. So think about that for a moment. So what, what does the world need right now? Do you think there's a little bit of a problem with race relations in America today in the world? What's the solution? The Holy Spirit brings us together. Okay? You want to grieve the Holy Spirit? Be a racist. You want to be a, grieve the Holy Spirit? Look down on somebody else. You want to be a, uh, you want to grieve the Holy Spirit? Get involved with a political movement instead of God's movement. And this is what happened back then. So what is Pentecost? We talked about it. It was a 50 days. What happened at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit birthed into the church. Why does it matter to us now? Why even bother with it, right? Why? Why? Well, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. This is what Jesus says. I have a mission. I am, I am so confident that you can do the mission, so this is what I want you to do. As the Father sends me, so I send you. And that includes us today. What was the mission of Jesus? I'm so glad you asked the question. The twofold purpose of Jesus' mission. Very clear. First one, the most important. If this one doesn't happen, nothing else matters. Okay, the first one is this. The perfect sac sacrificial lamb who takes the sins of the world away. Jesus came to pay for sins that you and I cannot pay for. You and I are imperfect. I know some of you have a hard time believing that. Okay? You and I are imperfect people. There's only one perfect, and that's God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. So Jesus came. What he did? He came. God came to earth. He was sinless, but he also did. If you read Philippians chapter 2, it talks about he emptied all of his godly power. He emptied all of his privileges and rights, basically, and he became one of us except one major difference. He didn't have sin. And he limited his power and the scope of what he did to be a human being. And all we know about when he was born, when he's a toddler, when he's 12 years old, and then also we hear about him when he's 30, which was the rabbinic tradition when you would start your ministry. So what happened then? Well, he was the perfect sacrificial lamb. Okay, now let me make something clear. If Jesus were to live a perfect life, never heal anybody, Never, never multiply loaves and fishes. Nothing like that. He just lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross. Would that be enough for us today? Yes. It'd be fine. We'd be saved. And if that would be the case, then probably as soon as we give ourselves to Jesus, we should all be raptured. I gave my life to Jesus. Whoop, you're gone. That's what Jesus would have done. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, it would be. Okay, let's move on. So what, what happened here? Jesus had one, one purpose was what? To be the sacrificial lamb. So our job as a church is to bring people to Jesus, that they be baptized into Jesus, that they would give their lives to him, become born again. But there's another purpose that Jesus has, and the church has exempted itself from the second part. Proclaim and expand the kingdom. How did Jesus proclaim and expand the ministry? How did he do it? Well, this is what happened. On the day... On John 1, and by the way, this is found in all the Gospels. And John bore witness to this. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. What happened was this. Jesus was like you and I until the Jordan River. He was like you and I, but perfect, which is a lot different, but you get what I'm saying. So some of you have a mother law that's perfect. I know. But anyhow, he, he went to the river, and what happened is the Bible says the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. The Holy Spirit is now no bird. It means it came gently. He's not a bird. It says like, a simile. You, you got that, everybody? I've seen people say the Holy Spirit's a bird, and he's not a bird. Okay? Not Leonard Skinner, okay? Not a bird. So uh, anyhow, so what happened was the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and it remained. 
the whole, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when he did, he was inaugurated into supernatural ministry. Everything Jesus did, he did in relationship with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you catch what I'm saying? Okay. Now, with that in mind, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout the surrounding country. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, because he's anointed. This is what Jesus' mission is, and by the way, our mission as well. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery to the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is what Jesus says. He says to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Now check this out. So he tells us, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage I go away. Now, if you were to ask me today and say, wouldn't you wish Jesus was here? I'd say, absolutely. I believe he's here in spirit. I'm talking about physically on the earth. Don't you want him here right now? I would. But Jesus says, it's actually to your advantage I go away, that he may come. Basically, the same power that I have, the same power that rose me from the dead is going to reside in you. The same power that gave me the ability to walk on water and to feed the multitudes, I'm going to give to you. But I can't do it till I go to the Father. That's what he says. It's to your advantage I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come. That's the Holy Spirit, paraclete, when it comes alongside. But if I go, I will send him to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, let's check this out, will also do the works that I do. And by the way, God is doing amazing works even today. I've seen miracles. I've seen metal plates in people's leg that used to be there go away. They were healed. It was, it was unbelievable. I saw it. I've seen God do miraculous things. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. But that's not what's important. What's important is people give their lives to Jesus, and they're transformed. Those signs are supposed to lead you to Jesus. They're not an end. They're a means to the end. So truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And what? Greater works. And you can see that in the book of Acts where Peter's shadow was healing people. That never happened with Jesus. He wasn't greater than Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was working through the church. Then these will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. It's amazing what he's telling, you, telling us to do. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So there is something about a relationship with God, trusting him, right? And what does Jesus say? Be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a command for us to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to shut that door of my life. I want to keep that part of the house away. I don't want to deal with the bathroom. I like the kitchen. I don't want to deal with the garage, right? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. How many, wouldn't it be nice to have someone with us forever? Absolutely. And behold, I'm sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed. It's something you put on. That's right. You have to put on. I need to wrap it up. How can I experience a baptism with the Holy Spirit? How? Let's get right to the point. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, this is what happened. The Holy Spirit fell. They heard people speak in their other languages. They're like, what do we do? And here's what Peter said. He said the following. He said to them, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent. Have you repented? Have you given your life to Jesus? That's the most important thing. Have you given your life to Jesus? That's the most important thing you can do. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Give your life to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to show you a couple of things. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Guess who's far off? Me and you. Everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. But when they believed, Philip, as he preached. I want to show you some things, okay? I want to show you some things. As we conclude our time here today, I want to show you a few things about the Holy Spirit and how they receive it and how it's not just, didn't just happen at salvation. You see, what happens is this. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus, but Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. So, but when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom, God of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. They were baptized like we do on Sunday morning. 
Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They were saved already. Now they needed to receive the Holy Spirit. For, he'd only, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's enough to get saved. But don't you want to have the power of God in your life? Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. About 25 years later, this happens again. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Let me ask you a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they say what many of us say today. No. We've not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. And Paul said, okay, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come. That's Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. So they gave their life to Christ. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. You can also see in Cornelius' house later on, the Gentiles began to speak in tongues as well. Now, tongues is not all there is. A lot of Pentecostals, that's all it's about. I speak in tongues. If I were to give you my watch, this is a digital one, but if it's a real watch, and I said, I'm going to give you my watch, and all I do is I give you the second hand. Have I given you my watch? No. So when the Holy Spirit gives you himself, he doesn't just give you the second hand. He gives you the whole watch. When the Holy Spirit gives you gifts, He gives you all the gifts. Now it's for us to be led by the Spirit to utilize all the gifts in person and work of the Holy Spirit. So, and so what they began to uh, speak in tongues and prophesy. So, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not make me better than you, but it makes me better than me. And for a long time, many people in the Pentecostal church were, were, were spirit filled, and they're not spirit filled like we are. That's so arrogant and foolish and dumb, and it's, it's terrible. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. And that should be the attitude of everything. What about the tongues? Well, we can't get everything settled today, but let me just say this. Tongues is like a pair of shoes. They come with it. I thought that was funny. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray. There's two types of tongues. There's tongues for a public gift that you would speak in, in, a, in a, an assembly or something like that, and then there's private prayer language. Okay, we're, we're going to break this down in a whole series. Amen. We're going to break it down in a whole series. Okay, but just for now, I want to help you with this, because people get hung up with this. And I appreciate John keeping it more flowing, because this is a controversial part. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself inter intercedes for us with groanings. You ever get to the point, I'm out of words? So many times, I would just, I've been prayed for, and I, I do speak in tongues, and I speak in tongues every day. Uh, when I go to the store, I go to the cashier, and I go, blah, blah, blah. no, I'm not just kidding. Should have bought a Honda. No, I don't do that. But I do pray privately. I prayed before I came out here today. I've been praying a little bit even as we've been up here. I pray you experience. It's not the end all get all. It's one of the gifts, but it's, a, it's, it's available to everybody, okay? So Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings. And he searches the hearts, knows what's in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. Would you like to be built up? Okay. But the one who prophesies builds the church up. So there is a spiritual language you can use to build yourself up. Now, I just want to conclude with this. We're obviously not going to be able to do it justice, and it frustrates me. Pastor, what about this? I know I cannot have one sermon that's 28 minutes and touch all the things, okay? That's why we're going to have a series on this. But the bottom line is the Holy Spirit's available for you today. He wants to take over your life. But you first have to give your life to Jesus. Check this out. If a son asks for bread from a father, some of you are scared about the Holy Spirit. Am I going to do something weird? Am I going to levitate and head going to go around with pea soup? No. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen, okay? If a son asks for bread from the father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to you, 
to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You ask God for the Holy Spirit, and you, you're already a believer. God will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is ask. It's like giving your life to Jesus Christ. You ask. You can't save yourself. You can't baptize yourself. You just got to receive it. So, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Today is a great day for that. But before we do that, have you given your life to Jesus? I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a few moments. If you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day for that. You want to repeat after me in your own heart, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and I believe you rose again three days later. I step down from being in charge of my life. I declare my life is not my own. I give it to you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins based upon my confession that you are Jesus and I've given my life to you. Thank you that I am now your child and I am forgiven. I ask you to wash me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And this day, I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, we believe you became born again. Jesus says, come, follow me. It's a journey. It's not one prayer and you're done. It's, it's a journey. Now the question is this. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you'd like to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. By the way, he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a command. If Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, who do we think we are not to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? If the apostle Paul and all the apostles were filled with the Spirit, who do we think we are? We can do it without it. Now, can we still go to heaven? Yes. But God has us here for the second purpose, is to bring the kingdom of God in this culture, in this way. So I'm going to ask you right now, to, if, you're just going to, if you can keep your eyes open or closed, it doesn't make a difference. But I want to ask you to pray after me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, you promised you would baptize me with the Holy Spirit. According to your word, I ask you right now to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I receive you in faith. Come fill me with your power, your presence, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I believe some of you right now sense something. The person in the last service said when they, when they prayed, they felt something warm come over them, and they felt something bubble up inside of them. I mean, that's what happened to me doesn't have to happen that way. But I want to encourage you to go back home and to worship God and st start believing God for miracles. You're going to see something different in your life. Remember, it's not what you've done. It's what Christ has done. It's a gift. All you have to do is receive it. Amen? Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. It's, a hard, it's hard to do that all in 38 minutes. But I want to encourage you. Today's Pentecost. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways we, we continue to give to the Lord is what you can see on your screen. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire to 77977. You don't have to give online. Or through your, you can text message that. You can also use our PushPay app or CornerstoneCheshire.com or snail mail. Also in the back we have boxes. And if you give your life to Christ as well, you can put that number up there as well. And, and also fill out so much I have to cover. Or fill out one of these cards so much. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm kind of shoehorning this in real quick. But we want to be able to give back to what God has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. So thank you so much, everybody. Let me just uh, pray over you. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make the way up forward. If you need prayer, you want someone to pray for you, we'd be honored to do that. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Spirit of God fill you to overflowing. That the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, and the power of God would overwhelm you. Go in the peace and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody, and let's be filled with the Holy Spirit.